By my estimations, I probably put over 100,000 miles on my car. So as you can see, this one has never been opened. Carbon fiber reinforced plastic. And I've actually proved this to a lot of people that have high power cars like M cars. I said, let's do a quick zero to 40 and I'm gonna prove to you that I can actually keep up with you. From 2014 until the BMW i4 arrived two, three years ago, BMW kind of dropped the ball. Hey guys, welcome back to the BMW blog YouTube channel and welcome to a new episode featuring a BMW car. But this is a little bit different today because it actually touches me personally. It's a quite sad day for me because I have to drive to a BMW dealership and finally turn in my BMW i3 as you see it right behind me. But before we talk about this car and the car that's going to replace it, let me tell you a little bit about my story with the BMW i3 and how it all started. It actually started in 2014 when BMW finally decided to introduce a mass production electric vehicle. And that was the BMW i3. It was quite a revolutionary for its time. It featured a CFRP carbon fiber reinforced plastic chassis and it was quite, quite unique in the segment. They were actually quite the pioneers in 2014. So I decided to actually get one. Since 2014, I've owned four BMW i3s. Every two, three years, I would lease a new one. I would keep the same spec and I would just get a different color. It's always been a BMW i3 range extender and I've always kept the same interior choices. So of course, I have a lot of experience with a BMW i3 and this car has been part of my family for all these years, has been used as a family car with kids, with car seats, for road trips, for daily driving. And by my estimations, I probably put over 100,000 miles on my cars combined all these years. So in this video, I'm going to tell you more about the BMW i3, why I still love the car quite a bit, why I'm going to replace it. I'm going to tell you a little bit about how it drives. And I'm gonna tell you, or maybe tease you a little bit about the car that's coming next because it's quite unique. It's got a very crazy spec and we're gonna have a separate video on that. So with that being said, let's go take a look. All right, so this is my spec, a 2020 BMW i3 range extender in midnight blue. As I've said, I've had four of them. And this one, it's the blue one because I've had a white, I've had an all black one, and I've had a very, very vibrant red. As you can see, I've kept the stock wheels. So those are the 19 inch wheels and tires. Of course, the design of those wheels have never been my favorite, but for cost reasons and also because of the aero efficiency of them, I decided to always spec the cars with this one. Of course, this is a typical BMW hatchback design. And as you can see, it has a very unique door arrangement. Even though you see only one door handle, it has suicide doors. So if you open them, you can actually see that. And we're gonna talk about the interior and about the car seats and all of that in a second. So let me close it up. Let's go to the front. As you can see, this one has a very, very unique design. So when it came out in 2014, it was extremely different than any other BMW that you might have seen on the road. Of course, it still kept the double headlamps, you know, typical to BMW cars. It had a very traditional Kini grille, but of course, closed off because it's an electric car. If you move to the side, you will see once again the hatchback proportions. And even though it looks quite, quite small from the outside, the car is actually surprisingly spacious. This is why this car has been a family car for me for the last nine years. Now let's go to the back. And you can also see the hatchback design right there. And of course, a decently spacious boot. So let me open it up actually for a second because I've used this car to transport furniture, to transport Christmas trees. And of course, I've used it for road trips. I can see right here, I have my backpack in there. I have a large stroller. And of course, you can put the seats down and have a lot more room because it's got this hatchback design, it's quite tall, so you can fit actually a lot of things inside. You would be shocked how many things I was able to transport over the years with this car. Now, let me close it up once again, and let me show you one more thing, because this is actually a first for me. I've had a car for the last three years, and I have never, never opened up the front, which is the front trunk. We always talk about these, everybody wants a front trunk, but honestly, in real life, 
you rarely use it. Of course, this one is a little bit different than the modern ones because it's not winterized, so it's not weatherproof. So essentially, if you want to store something in there, it's likely going to get wet. So with that being said, let's take a look inside there because honestly, I've never, never opened that one. Right there, that's open. And let's see what's in there. I'm assuming a lot of leaves, a lot of things that I should have probably cleaned over the years, of course, here we go. So as you can see, this one has never been opened. Even the charging cable, it's still in the original bag. So let me close it up for now. And let me show you inside, right? Because I've talked about the doors and the suicide doors, and I'm gonna tell you why I actually love them. So if you have kids, and if you have a couple of car seats or just one, especially if it's front facing, you can see how easy it actually is to get in and out. Of course, I'm quite tall, so you can see the seat is pushed all the way back, yet I still have space. I'm 6'2", I'm sitting comfortably, and I'm able to actually drive with a car seat behind me. Now, if you have kids, they're gonna be able to quickly kind of get themselves inside, and of course, it's a lot easier to take them out. Now, if we go to the other side, I'm gonna show you the other car seat because it's a rear-facing car seat, which makes it a little bit more challenging. Yet, because the doors open quite wide, I mean, look at this. You can see how wide they're actually open. It's still quite easy to put an infant in there. So you can see the rear facing seat. Of course, those are massive seats as well. And even with that, I have a lot of space. Now, of course, the passenger seat is pushed forward quite a bit, but you can still go backwards, maybe another inch or two, or even lean the back seat a little bit more. So why am I showing this? Because a lot of people look at my car and say, how can you use this as a family car? And I'm like, why not? Please come inside, take a look at the space, and you realize that you have almost as much space as in a three series. I mean, you can see right there because there is no transmission tunnel. You have a lot of space up front. Of course, it's quite dirty right now. I had a chance to actually wash it. And because there is no engine at the front, you can see how much space you actually have for your legs. Everything is pushed forward and it's quite spacious, quite airy, as you can see. Plenty of headroom as well. But we're gonna talk about that when I drive the car. So let me close it off one more time. And I'm gonna show you one other cool thing that I love about the car. Carbon fiber reinforced plastic. So the entire chassis is made of carbon fiber and that's something that you don't usually see cars that are priced in the 50,000 range, right? You see carbon fiber cars, maybe in high-end supercars, or even in the BMW i8, which is quite expensive as well. So this is one of the reasons why I fell in love with the BMW i3. It's a very lightweight car, it's easy to maneuver, and it's quick, even though it doesn't have a lot of power. It's a quick and fun car. And of course, I'm gonna tell you more about that when I drive it. So, so let me close the doors, give you one more look. And I'm gonna tell you in the next portion of the video why I'm taking the car back to the dealership and why I'm getting a different BMW this time. So here's a quick look, and then we're gonna hop inside and go for a drive. All right, so let's go for a drive with the BMW i3. Let me tell you more about the car. All right, so once again, the BMW i3 and the i8 are really the cars that started the i brand. Of course, today we're so used to seeing i's on many, many BMWs. And we, of course, we have now the new i4, we have the i5, the i7, and a lot more coming up in the future. But in 2014, the i subdivision was something brand new for BMW. It was their foray into the electric world. It was at a time when electromobility was really not on the radar of many automakers. I believe Tesla started around the same time, but when you look at traditional automakers, there was nobody on the market that had a brand new from ground up built electric vehicle. Of course, you had a lot of conversion vehicles. BMW had a couple of those as well for testing purposes, like the Mini E Electric and of course the BMW Active E. 
but the BMW i3 and the i8 were really revolutionary because they were featuring a very, very unique architecture. It was based on CFRP, as I've said a little bit earlier today, which is the carbon fiber reinforced plastic. It was a sustainable car as well, as you can see inside. The door panels are made of this material called hemp, which is sustainable. The seats are sustainable. So they were trying, even in 2014, to become a more sustainable company overall. The company poured billions of dollars in this new platform, but unfortunately only two products ever emerged from it, and that was the BMW i3 and the BMW i8, which even today is such a stunning car. Design-wise, as I've said in the intro video, the i3 was completely different than any other BMWs. I mean, if you look in the history of the brand, even in the concept lineup, there is nothing, nothing to come close to the i3 as far as the design. Of course, the suicide doors are unique as well, especially for a production series BMW. So. In 2014, I remember that I was still owning my 1M, I still have it today, and I was looking for my next daily driver. I knew nothing about electric cars. Of course, I drove the i3 briefly once, but that was the extent of my experience with the i3. There was an international media launch, and actually one of my teammates went to that one and spent more time with the car. So, 2014 needed a new car, needed a new daily driver, and I didn't want to get an SUV. I live in Chicago. I always felt like I don't need a big SUV in the city. I want a car that's easy to maneuver, easy to drive, but at the same time, I don't want to spend too much money on gasoline. So the BMW i3 popped up on my radar. I ordered a car from New York, actually. It was shipped to Chicago. Haven't driven the car before. I simply picked the spec from the BMW USC configurator, I sent my order in to the dealer in Manhattan or New Jersey, I don't remember exactly, and then the car was shipped to me. Received the car, hopped right inside, and I started to learn more about what the BMW i3 really is, to own it, to daily drive it, and all of that. About a week later, I completely fell in love with the car. I realized how practical it is. I realized how cool it actually is. There were definitely not that many on the road. Every time I would see somebody in Chicago, even today with an i3, we wave at each other because it was such a small club. Speaking of that small club, as a side note, over the production period of nine years almost, I think BMW sold close to 250,000 units. By their standards, the i3 was probably not the biggest sales success in the history of the company, but it was definitely a car that opened the doors for many other electric BMWs to come. And of course, a lot of the lessons learned with the i3 and with the i8 were applied in future BMW i products. But from a brand perspective, from a marketing perspective, the i3 was and still is a genius car. It showed that BMW can look into the future and produce sustainable cars, eco-friendly cars, and especially emission-free cars. Of course, there is a counter-argument there. I felt like from 2014 until the BMW i4 arrived two, three years ago, BMW kind of dropped the ball. They should have built another i3 sedan or maybe an i4 a little bit sooner and on the same platform, not on a conversion platform or on a flexible platform as they call it. I believe that if BMW would have come up in 2016, 2017 with a Tesla Model 3 type of vehicle, they would have been extremely, extremely successful with the car. So that's my biggest pet peeve with the BMW i subdivision. They went all the way up, they were innovators, and then they kind of dropped the ball, and then they turned to this flexible car architecture, which is great. The cars drive nicely. They're quite spacious because they're bigger in size, but they're not the i3. It's not this very bespoke and very unique platform, which allows you for very unique packaging inside as well. I mean, look at me. I am 6'2", 1.9 meters tall almost, and I have so much space, even with two car seats behind me. So as you can imagine, everybody that jumps into my BMW i3, they're actually surprised how much room you have inside. When I tell them that once I actually transported about a 10-foot Christmas tree to my home by simply just feeding the Christmas tree through this tunnel right here, they were shocked. Chuck, one of my good friends and you know someone that works with me at BMW Blog, 
He also used this one to transport bicycles and music instruments and so on and so forth. So it shows the versatility of the car. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the specs. So with the BMW i3, you had two options initially. You had a BMW i3 all electric, and then you had a BMW i3 with a range extender, which was a very, very unique proposition because essentially BMW paired the electric drivetrain with a 647cc motor from a BMW motorcycle in order to use that motor to extend the range of the car. So how does it work? The car also comes with a gasoline tank. Initially, it was a 1.9 gallon, I believe, in the US, and I'll explain why. And then eventually, you know, it was a 2.4 gallon, even though the car always had the same tank capacity, but it was limited by software. And by putting gasoline in the car, then the range extender would be able to actually recharge the battery while driving. So I've always picked the i3 with a range extender because it gave me a peace of mind. I never wanted to deal with the infrastructure because in 2014, there were not a lot of charging stations and definitely not a lot of fast charging stations. Even today, Chicago, it's lacking in that department quite a bit. Of course, initially I had a charging station in my home, but for the last, I would say six years, that has not been the case. So I've recharged my car at public charging stations. But by having that range extender, I always had that peace of mind that if I need the range, if I'm stuck somewhere where I cannot recharge it, or if I wanna take a long road trip, then I would always be able to stop, put some gasoline in and drive away. But of course, I never really wanted to rely too much on the range extender because one, I didn't want to spend money on gasoline, especially the last few years has been quite expensive. And then second of all, I felt like I was a little bit cheating on the whole electric thing by simply going to a gas station and putting some gasoline in. But it was a nice thing to have, even though it was quite expensive, I believe it adds a few thousand dollars on top of the base MSRP. So that was the initial i3. It started with a 18 kilowatts hour battery that was the usable capacity then you went to a 27 and eventually it came with this 37.9 uh, almost 38 kilowatts hours battery capacity which i believe in europe it's 120 ah of course you might be wondering so how much range would i get because today you see battery capacities over 100 kilowatts and that's kind of becoming the standard in many many cars so the epa rating on the BMW i3, just the all-electric portion of it, it's about 126 miles. Of course, that varies quite a bit based on the temperature outside, preconditioning of the battery. Same with all the other BMW electric cars or any other electric car. The range extender component adds about 70 to 80 miles. So essentially, if you want to round it up, you will get about 200 miles in perfect conditions with the BMW i3, the 2020 version that I have right now. Is that enough? For my use case, it was plenty. Honestly, the reason why I'm giving the car back, it's not because of the range, and I'm gonna explain that in a second, but it's really because I don't have a choice today. So from a range perspective, it was always been enough for me, enough for my family. I daily drive maybe 20, 30 miles at most. If I needed to do a long trip, then I would just use that range extender. But of course, I also adjusted the way that I drive the car and how I interact with the car. So even right now, it's quite cold in Chicago. It's in the 40s, you know, Fahrenheit, and I'm actually not running any heat inside. So I've got used to this idea that if I drive my i3, I want it to be as efficient as possible. I want it to have the longest range possible. So I would always make sure to wear the appropriate clothing for the temperature outside. So in this case, it's quite cold. I have thicker clothes on me, the AC, the heat is off and that's going to extend the range a little bit. So that's one way how I adjust it, how I interact with the BMW i3. Of course, I'm taking full advantage of the one paddle braking regeneration. The car only has one setting compared to the multiple settings that you see today in the i4, for example. So by learning how the car behaves, by learning how much will it take to actually stop or the distance it needs to stop, I'm constantly using that one paddle fill to recharge the battery as much as possible. 
And of course, when I drive on the highway, I'm trying to stay in the 55 to 60 miles per hour limit because that's probably the most efficient speed that the i3 can perform at. So with the occasional 70, maybe 75 miles per hour, you no know, bursts if I need to get somewhere faster. But I would say most of the time, I'm gonna try to stay with that 55 to 60 limit in order to have the best efficiency of the car. So the BMW i3 makes around 180 horsepower and about 184 pounds feet of torque. Of course, by many today's standards, it might seem underpowered, but it's not because even with the range extender, it only weighs around 3,200 pounds, which honestly, looking at all the new electric cars today, even BMW cars, this is actually quite, quite light. And because of that, the car can do this. Keep in mind, I'm not even in the full power mode. I'm actually running in the Eco Pro mode to extend the range. But as you can see, the car just zips. It's actually extremely, extremely quick from like 10 to 40 miles per hour. And I've actually proved this to a lot of people that have high power cars like M cars. I said, let's do a quick zero to 40 and I'm gonna prove to you that I can actually keep up with you. Of course, past 40, the car, it's going to be a little bit sluggish. It goes from zero to 100 kilometers per hour, zero to 62 miles per hour in about 7.3 seconds, which is not fast. But for city driving, for quick overtaking, it's actually extremely, extremely fun to drive and it's quite, quite quick. So in my personal experience, the car never felt underpowered and it was exactly what I needed from a city car, from a daily driver. Top speed, it's rated 93 miles per hour. And honestly, if you live in the US, you will never reach the top speed because it is illegal, first of all, it's probably gonna put you in jail and you don't have to do that. Honestly, you're just gonna kill the efficiency on the car anyway. If you live in Germany and you have access to the Autobahn, clearly the 93 miles per hour will feel quite, quite slow. But then again, for my particular use case, the top speed of 93 miles per hour, it was never an issue. I mentioned charging. So I believe the standard AC charging, it's rated at 7.4 kilowatts. But if you are getting the DC fast charging, which initially was an option in the BMW i3, then it became standard, then that's rated at 50 kilowatts. Of course, today you have cars that have double, if not more of that you know, charging capacity. But honestly, the charging times compared to the i4 and to the iX are comparable because of the smaller battery packs. So I've tested this in the past and I've realized that you can go from like zero to 80% in about 30 minutes. Of course, it also varies based on the temperature outside, but in most cases, quick snacks of charging, it was more than enough. Now also let me tell you about the other i3s that I've had, because as I mentioned earlier, I've had four of them. So I've started with the 60AH1, which is you know, the 18 kilowatts hours battery pack. Then I moved over to the 27 one, and then eventually I got upgraded to this latest and greatest battery pack. Of course, the first one that I had in 2014, the range was extremely, extremely low. I remember getting in winter time, in the 50 miles range, which was definitely not enough. But it was also at the time when I was able to install a charging station in my garage, and that made it a little bit more usable as a daily driver. When I got the larger battery pack, the 27, I felt like the range was decent. It was still below 100 miles, maybe in the 80 miles range, 90 miles range. But even with that, you know, having access to that, you know, home charging, uh, it made my life a little bit easier as far as a daily driver. Naturally, if I were to recommend a BMW i3 today, I would absolutely recommend getting the latest battery pack, the largest one, because it will make your life a little bit easier. Of course, once again, if you do have access to home charging, then you don't have to worry too much. But if you do have to, you know, charge publicly, or if you have to find a fast charger, I absolutely recommend getting this one. I might even go a step further. I would recommend actually getting the BMW i3 S, which is the sportier version of the BMW i3, which came out a few years ago, but it adds a little bit more sportiness to the ride. It's a little bit stiffer. It's got wider wheels, wider body, and it makes it a little bit more stable on the highway. Because if you've driven an i3, 
if you go on the highway and it's quite quite windy then you will actually feel that the car will actually roll from side to side it's a very strange feeling because you really have to hold on tight to the steering wheel to make sure that you're staying in your lane but that's a behavior that you get used to it especially if you've had a car for quite some time as you can see in this video and you've seen in the intro video as well i have two car seats right here initially there was just one and the family got bigger so now i have two small children an infant and a toddler so of course you have a rear facing seat and a front facing seat is it easy to travel with kids depends if you're the type of person that doesn't take a lot of road trips and you don't need a lot of things with you then it's absolutely fine i managed to load the trunk up with a couple of strollers in the past with a few bags that were needed for maybe a three four day trip and I had no issues with the car. As far as interior space, the kids are fine in the back. Even behind me, you know, the toddler has enough space for her legs. And of course, the infant on that side with the rear facing seat, I don't have to worry too much about that. Now, if I were to have two front facing seats, it will be a lot easier. One, because you're getting more room for the passenger right there. So you can go with the seat backwards a little bit more. Of course, you can lean the seat back a lot more as well. And you also make it a lot easier to get the kids in and out of the car because of the suicide doors. So as a daily driver, as a car that you use to take your kids to school or to a daycare or to a kindergarten, it is absolutely fine. And the kids love it because it feels spacious inside. It's actually got this really nice opening right here for the moonroof, for the sunroof, so you get a lot of light in. The car is kind of scooped on the outside a little bit, as you can see right here. So you have a lot of lateral room and the kids never feel cramped inside. Now, if you're the type of person that always wants to account for that 1% use case, which I usually define that as the person that says, what if I take a long road trip? Do I have enough space? And then I say, how many road trips do you take every year? Or one or two. And then I say, well, if you really need to fill up your car with a lot of things for that particular road trip, then just go rent a car. Rent an SUV, rent a minivan, and don't even drive your own car. You might actually save the miles on the car. You might not have to worry about somebody hitting your car or getting into an accident. And you'll have a lot more room in a bigger SUV. So don't buy the car for that 1% use case, but always buy the car for your most use cases, right? Which is probably daily driving, taking the kids to school, taking the kids to a soccer practice, for example. Is this car going to be enough for you? In my case, it was, and I know I've talked to a lot of i3 owners, and they told me the same thing. I never really felt that I needed a bigger car. Of course, we live in the US and a lot of people have, you know, second or third cars and that makes it a lot easier. I have a BMW 1M as well. Of course, it's not very spacious. It's actually less spacious than this car. But if you need more space for certain things, then of course, you can use your second car. Of course, a lot of BMW i3 owners, including myself, we've learned how to use certain apps and how to modify or code or decode certain features of the car. And I would say, the softer unlock of the gas tank is probably the number one mod that a lot of people have done in their BMW i3. I remember getting the car, immediately downloading an app, going into the OBD and making sure that I unlock that full tank capacity. It would give me a next range of about 20 miles, which was quite, quite significant for that time. Of course, there are other features that you can use. I mean, it's got a really long list of things that you can modify. And I believe one of them that I enjoy in doing in the i3, it's the um, ability to automatically fold the mirrors when you lock the car. So even from that perspective, the i3, it's always been the rebel. It's kind of been the hacker's car because you, if you go online, you see a lot of BMW forums and people talking about this and about all the crazy things they've modified in their BMW i3. So by now you might be wondering, why am I giving the car back? If I love this car so much, if this is the best BMW or the best BMW for me, if it's so perfect, why give it back? Well, for one reason. When I leased this car in 2020, the lease rates were extremely, extremely favorable. I believe I was paying in the $300 range for a three-year lease with 10,000 miles. I only have about 22,000 miles on it, so definitely 
did not reach my limit on that and the lease residuals the money factor which is the interest rate was quite quite good and this is why i had that very very low monthly payment i sometimes felt that i was driving a free car especially when the gas prices skyrocket but there is a downside to all of that the residual value of the car the payoff balance of the car it's quite high today so if i were to pay taxes on the car and purchase the car outright right now it would cost me about thirty-three thousand dollars now in 2020 2021 when i looked at the used car prices for the bmw i3s they were actually selling a lot higher than that there was a shortage of cars everybody was buying the used cars with the markup and the i3 was actually one of those cars that just skyrocketed in value but covid is gone the vehicle supply is back to normal the hype for electric vehicles has died down a little bit so of course the used car market is completely different so if i look at a comparable car as mine with the base spec i mean there is nothing inside that's special i don't have any leather seats or any fake leather seats i have this you know fabric i have manual seats i have the small screen as well and essentially it's a bare stock car those cars usually sell in the low 20,000 you know range so i would be out of pocket at least 10 12 13 thousand dollars so i had a choice to make would i spend the money and keep the car that i love keep the car that i know that it's very reliable because it has been extremely reliable out of all these four bmw i3s that i've had none of them had any major issues and i've owned them over the period of nine years or do i look for an alternative and the alternative today unfortunately it's only the bmw i4 for me I love the iX, I have one iX from BMW, the M60, and it's a fantastic car, I love it, it's absolutely perfect for what I need. I feel like it's a bigger, more mature, cooler BMW i3, but it's expensive and I didn't want to spend the money on it. I would have preferred if BMW would have sold the BMW iX1 or even the iX3 in the US, because even though the range on those cars, it's not great. It's exactly what I needed from a car. Not a very large SUV, still very practical and all electric. But unfortunately, there is no such option in the US. So the BMW i4, it's the next closest thing to the BMW i3 to me. Of course, there are plenty of other brands, but since I only talk about BMWs, I try to stay within the BMW family as much as possible. So I decided to take my BMW i3 back. I actually called BMW Financial Services first and I said, do you think we can work out a deal? I mean, look, the value of the car, it's a lot lower than before. What can we do to, you know, get a good deal on the car so I can still drive it? So that way you don't have to take it back to the dealer. You don't have to send it for an auction. And unfortunately, that's not possible. So BMW Financial Services doesn't actually negotiate with the customer. You have to take the car back to the dealer. Then you can probably negotiate with the dealer, you know, a used car price once again. I just didn't want to go through all that hassle. And then I decided to simply just get an i4. And let me tell you, the i4 that I got, it's the eDrive 40, so it's not the M50. I wanted to be price conscious about that, but it's got a crazy and wild spec. And I can't wait to actually show that to my wife because she only knows the exterior color of the i4 but she has no idea about the interior of the car and the combination of the exterior and the interior and how crazy that is speaking of the daily driving my wife also loves this car quite a bit she's actually extremely sad that i'm taking the car back because even though she's had SUVs in the past and she's always been telling me, I love my SUVs, they're so big, they're so comfortable, they're so safe. I don't think I can drive a small car, it just doesn't feel right. And I said, take the i3, drive it for a little bit, let me know what you think, and then we can reassess the situation. And she simply fell in love with the car. She was always excited that we're going to get a new one, she was excited that we're getting a new color. And even now she's extremely, extremely genuinely sad that I'm taking the car back she always felt like the i3 was such an easy car to daily drive it was easy to maneuver the turn radius on the car it's absolutely amazing the best the bmw offers today you can squeeze in between cars it's easy to park in chicago it's easy to make u-turns 
And because of that, she always felt like the i3 was effortless to drive. So let me show the turn radius. I mean, as you can see, there is not much space here. So if I do this, I'm almost able to do a full turn. I mean, look at this. This was the tightest road I could find. Now, of course, if we were to go straight ahead, I mean, there is a lot more room and I'm gonna show you right there the turn radius on the car because it's truly, it's truly phenomenal. So let me go around the speed bump and here we go. So hopefully you can see this, right? So there is kind of like a two lane parking lot right here. So let's see if I can do it in a full lock and how much space I have on that side. So here we go, full lock and look, it almost rotates on its own axis. I mean, look at that. I mean, I could probably do it right here. It's even tighter now. So here we go. Absolutely fantastic. I am absolutely going to miss this, considering that the i4, it's no near as good when it comes to the turn radius. And she also loved the fact that it was a quite special car. She would get thumbs up all the time from a lot of people because you don't see a lot of i3s on the road, especially in Chicago, you know, because it's cold. A lot of people don't want to buy the i3 because of the range. So for all these reasons, she absolutely loves the BMW i3. So it will be interesting to see what she thinks about the i4 as well, because she's never driven one. She's seen them clearly because I bring them home to test drive, but I've never really put her behind the wheel to see what it feels like. So it will be quite interesting to see her reaction coming from the BMW i3, especially after nine years. So as I'm driving the last few miles with my BMW i3, I'm getting this feeling of sadness, of course. As I've said before, has been part of my family for so long. It's a car that I built memories with. It's a car that also helped me understand electric vehicles quite a bit. And even now when I drive new BMW cars, I'm always somehow comparing them to the BMW i3. So for me, it's always been the benchmark in many, many ways. Of course, maybe the range has never been as good as a Tesla maybe, but in other ways, I would say it's miles ahead of a Tesla Model 3, for example, and I've talked about the chassis and all of that. So I'm absolutely going to miss this car. I also think that if the future prices will drop, I want to maybe pick one up once again, maybe keep this car as a, I don't know, forever classic BMW in my garage. I've been eyeing the galvanic gold BMW i3 that my friend Chuck has but unfortunately he's not willing to sell that one to me so I'll have to keep my eyes open maybe for a galvanic gold i3 because I truly love that color it really pops it really stands out and I have a feeling that's going to be a very classic color in the future so this was not your typical drive review. I mean, you probably have seen a lot of long-term reviews of the i3. Chuck also published his long-term review of the i3 maybe a couple of years back, so it's always worth checking that out. But this particular review was more about my personal connection with the i3, why I love the i3, and the reasons why I'm deciding to replace it with the i4. So if you made it this far, once again, thank you for also being part of this journey with me. If you've been following me for all these years, you've definitely seen this car, maybe other i3s as well. But I'm also equally excited now to show you my i4 spec. And I would love to know what you think about that one. But before you do that, tell me what you think about the BMW i3. Do you feel like this has been a really groundbreaking car for BMW? Should BMW build another i3 type of car or should a BMW keep building them until new i class arrive? If you're one of the i3 lucky owners, honestly, I hope you're not as weak as I am and you will keep that car and spend the money because I still feel that this car is absolutely worth its value. So with that being said, guys, thank you for watching. Thanks for all of your support and I will see you in the next one.